Greetings once again in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope and soon returning King, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Although we have several more Old Testament books left to explore as we search for Jesus in the Old Testament, we've arrived at one of the latest books chronologically. Nehemiah builds on the account of Ezra when the Jewish people began returning from exile in Babylon to reestablish themselves in the Promised Land. Cyrus of Persia was the pagan king who allowed the Jews to return to the land just as God foretold. But even as they did so, they were ridiculed by the people who had moved into the land in their absence. And by the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, about 444 BC, the action picks up with Nehemiah, a man uniquely positioned to receive the favor of the king. That's right. Nehemiah was the trusted cupbearer to King Artaxerxes in Susa, a city on the plain of the Tigris River just east of Basra, Iraq, but in modern-day Iran. Hearing of the distress of the Jews who had returned to the land and the broken down status of Jerusalem, he was moved to mournful fasting and prayer. His personal repentance for the sins of Judah and Israel echo the prayers of Daniel, but his heartfelt grief led to great risk. Nehemiah dared to appear downcast before the king, a potential capital offense, even for a trusted cupbearer. And Artaxerxes obviously trusted and loved Nehemiah because the king inquired about Nehemiah's discouragement. Nehemiah had given the matter much thought because he described the condition of his homeland and asked permission to return and set it right. Exactly, but not before he lifted up a hopeful prayer. Nehemiah was a gifted leader who is remembered for rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. Our guest today is also a gifted leader who encourages followers of Jesus Christ to rebuild our nation's Christian foundations, a task that grows more urgent by the day. Some of you may already know our guest today. David Barton is the founder and leader of Wall Builders, an organization dedicated to presenting America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on the moral, religious, and constitutional foundation on which America was built. His ministry, and that is indeed what it is, is headquartered just west of Fort Worth. David, I'm glad you're here with us. Tim, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, brother. David, what motivated you to establish Wall Builders, and how was Nehemiah, you know, both the book and the man, an inspiration to you? Uh, way back in 1987 and 1988, uh, the first book I ever wrote was called America to Prayer Not to Pray. And it, it came from my background. I was, a, I was not a history guy. I was a math and science guy. I was principal of the school, coached basketball. And in the midst of being invited to Washington, D.C. to participate in Concerned Women for America conference they had, um, they asked us to set up a, a, a meeting with our congressman. And we did so, and I didn't know what in the world to say to a congressman, never met one, didn't really care to meet one. Uh, I was real content with what I was doing in the country. And so in, in, in praying about what we should do with the congressman, I just prayed and kind of blew it off like a lot of people do. But in, in this case, the prayer turned out to be something very significant. Um, the, the scripture says, if you commit your ways to the Lord, he'll establish your thoughts. And so for the next several weeks, I had two thoughts that I woke up with every morning, had every night. I could not get rid of them. And the two thoughts were, when was God taken out of schools and what has happened to SAT scores since World War II? And SAT scores, I'm a principal. I know SAT scores in the 80s because that's when I was teaching school, running school. But I didn't know what they were since World War II. And I didn't know about prayer in school because we weren't praying in school. Didn't figure anybody had. And so I saw that statistically in 1963, the SAT scores plummeted and fell for 17 consecutive years after having been stable for since 1926. And then I saw that the first time prayer was ever taken out of schools is in 1962. And I go, oh my gosh, look at the correlation. We take prayer out of schools and the statistics drop and they plummet. And so that correlation was very significant. As a math and science guy, there's two kinds of correlations. One is when you have a, a slow trend, you know, where stats change over time. But the other, when something goes this way and goes down, you've had an impact, some point of impact. 
So I showed this to the congressman and said, what do you think? Is it possible that taking prayer out of schools would have affected academic knowledge? He goes, man, he said, we've debated prayer in schools a lot. I've never seen anything like this. He said, somebody ought to research this. And it's like God said, you hear that? Uh, that you. So for the next several weeks, we contacted uh, and asked for 47 different pieces of statistical information from cabinet level departments, uh, crime, uh, violence, uh, divorces, uh, parental, parental involvement, just everything you can think of. And it turned out that all 47 pieces of statistical evidence turned, turned downward violently in 1962-63. And it's like, wow, you can't get 47 pieces to do it the same way. And so as we looked at that and we looked at how the family was falling apart, how the country was falling apart, how education was falling apart, how individual lives were falling apart, um, my dad said to me, he said, you know, we, we ought to be like Nehemiah and call people to rebuild the walls because look how far this has fallen. And so that's where it came from. And so wall builders is a term out of Nehemiah 217, where Nehemiah says, look at the reproach we're in, let's rebuild the walls. And so over the next six months, uh, I read the book of Nehemiah from cover to cover once a day. And it gave a lot of guidance to this country boy on how to handle a lot of things that, that we now face on a regular thing. Nehemiah had his hostile media, Nehemiah had his opponents, Nehemiah had his enemies, Nehemiah had his allies, he had strategies on how to rebuild. Uh, the Bible is very, very good on, on how to restore something that's been torn down. Well, David, Nehemiah describes the report he receives from Judah concerning the state of the survivors and their capital. He was pierced to the heart. How does that experience relate to the state of our own nation and society? Yeah, and being pierced to the heart, it's interesting. I had not been pierced to the heart because I didn't know the state uh, of the nation. Uh, you know, I think it was like Nehemiah when he was cupbearer. He was happy with what he was doing. He was number, you know, really high in command there beside the king. And then he heard the report from his, his home country and he was pierced to the heart. And in my case, I've, I've been happily ignorant of all these things and did not know. And, and then I found that as we started sharing this, many Americans were happily ignorant. I think it's kind of like the fro frog boiling in water. Um, you, the water gets warmer around you, but you don't notice that. And if somebody points out, you know, the water used to be like this. Oh my gosh, it's changed that much. Didn't realize. And so in my case, I was happily content. I, listen, I grew up in a little town of 220 people. I rode my horse back and forth to work. The, the four things we never wanted to hear about was law, government, politics, and history. And, and yet here, when I get into it, that's, that affects every one of us. So it really was a wake up call and kind of like Nehemiah is when you get the report, you go, man, I didn't realize it was that bad. I've been surrounded by my own life and didn't know this was going on in the country. As we mentioned in our introduction, we found Nehemiah's initial response offers much insight to his own heart. What did he do? Yeah, Nehemiah, uh, you know, when he, when he told the people what needs to be done, they all said, this is an impossible task. Don't you see how bad it is? These walls used to be 70 feet high. Now they're all rubble. The stones that are massive and big, they're all piled up. There's no way we can do this. And I think it's very interesting that, that what Nehemiah did was he encouraged the people and he encouraged them in a way that I think is very good for, for culture at any point in time. He didn't encourage them to rebuild the whole walls. He encouraged them to rebuild their part of the walls. And so what, what happens is we often get captivated today with national news and we say, I can't change the president. I can't change Congress. I can't fix the Supreme Court. Great, don't do that. You just fix your own part right around. And, and I, it was striking to me that you had the men of Tekoa who put 1500 meters of wall together and you had the priest who didn't do anything except their own house. Well, good for them. At least they got their house up and their house was on the wall and that's a part of the wall. So when everybody did what they were able to do that they could do themselves in 52 days, this thing is finished. And that's what I think is always uh, astounding is when you look at the whole big task, it's too big. When you take a piece of the task, you can do it. And I was always struck with the fact that these people weren't qualified for what they were doing. There's no indication that there was a stonemason in any of those that returned. Uh, these were the dregs of society. These were the poor people that had been left behind. These were not the, the flower of Israel like Daniel had been that they took off. These were the, the, the people who had no skills, no trades. And so you're looking really at, at folks and as you look at who rebuilt the walls, there was a man and his daughters out there. Tell me what they know about laying stones. Uh, you had an apothecary out there. You had jewelers. You had perfume makers. You had a soldier out there. I mean, as the Bible goes through and talks about who rebuilt the walls, it was everybody, every common person. And they all did what they could. 
And when they all did what they could, what they did was rebuild the entire set of walls. It's, it's a fascinating story. Nathan, I think we just heard our application segment for today. Well, David, even with the king's blessing, Nehemiah's task was daunting. He faced numerous challenges and withering ridicule, but he did not waver in his task. What do you think inspired him to be so focused? You know, it's interesting. I think he understood his opposition. Uh, he, he knew his commission by God, but the interesting thing about his opposition, most of it came from within, not from without. As you look at Sanballat, Geshem, and Tobiah, interestingly, they were related to the priest. They were living in the temple. So what you've got is people who are literally in the temple, uh, you know, related to the leaders, the spiritual leaders being your opponents. And it, it's interesting, in, in all the years I spent both in politics and in church, uh, and, a, and a lot of years in both, I've learned that in those settings, I, I really need to wear bulletproof vest uh, figuratively, but I always wear them to the back because it's a friendly fire that kills you. You get more opponents from those around you than those that are outside. And so it wasn't like foreign enemies and foreign nations came and attacked him and said, you're rebuilding. It was those that were living in the temple. It were those that were living around him and that had been there, um, had been there for extensive parts of time, were related to the, to the priest. They're, they became the opponents. And that's the things I've learned in, in, in politics and in church is oftentimes it's easy to get discouraged because the people that should be with you are the ones that are opposing you. They're the ones that are writing letter back to the king saying, hey, stop this work. This is a bad work. And it's really people that should be with you that, that oppose. And that's one of the hardest things for people to overcome is the discouragement that comes when people you thought were on your side end up not being on your side. And that, again, is one of the great lessons I've learned from Nehemiah. Nehemiah was no wilting lily, was he, Tim? No, he certainly wasn't. When the going got tough and when the threats against rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem became extreme, he, he charged his men to be bold and rise to even that challenge. Yeah, he did. And it's interesting that it talks about the fact that they were built the walls with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Uh, they were well aware of the opposition they had. And it's interesting. I've always taken a model from Nehemiah on how he handled opposition. Um, and quite frankly, as, as I look at Nehemiah, he had a lot of bad media. Um, they had what they called open letters that they sent back to the king and back to the nation. And those would be news articles, open letters about you and how bad you are. And here's your motivation. And you're really whatever the, the media calls you. And he just ignored it and, and kept going. And when, uh, when Sam Ballot said, let's come down, I want you to debate me. I want you to come down. Let's talk about this. Nehemiah said, look, I've got too much work to do. I'm on the walls. I'm not coming down. They wanted to meet in the plains of Ono and have this discussion, this debate. And I've always, for, for me, I, I recognize this Bible approach where that Elijah loves debates. Elijah loves getting out with the opposition, talking to him. He's outnumbered 450 to one on, on top of the mountain. Let's have a debate there and see which God is God, your God or my God, and whoever answers by fire. I mean, Elijah loved getting toe to toe and going nose to nose, but Nehemiah did not do that. Nehemiah stayed out of the media. He, he didn't do the interviews. He didn't do the debates. He said, I got stuff to do. I, I'm working here. And he kept the people focused on what they were doing. And, and so the fact that it got so bad, and again, these are people that were living in the temple that are attacking him. He got, it got so bad that he had to have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. And, and, and I thought it was really interesting too, because he said, whatever part of the wall gets attacked, we're all going to rally there. So he had guys with trumpets. He said, whoever gets attacked, you, you, you blow the trumpet will come. I've always taken that as different parts of the wall. You, you, you've got like parental choice, or you got pro-life, or you got traditional marriage protection or gender or whatever. And it's like, wherever the, the trumpet sounds, let's all gather there and fight that fight. And then we'll come back and rebuild the rest of it. Because as you look at the walls of America, there's so many areas that have been torn down that have to be rebuilt. And it's like, it, it, I may be building my part, but I need to come help you when the trumpet sounds. And so that's the other thing I saw with Nehemiah was the great cooperation that existed and the focus they kept on just rebuilding. We're not getting into the side periphery debates. We're not going to let our enemy drive our, our rhetoric, our language, or our time. We're staying focused. And that's, that's something else that I think Nehemiah presents very well. And please do not misunderstand us. We're not advocating a confrontational attitude or violence. Right. But we are saying that Christians have a right to defend themselves and a responsibility to protect that which is sacred and holy from our own families to our own faith and even the institutions that have enabled us to live and worship freely before God. Yeah, and Tim, if I can add to that, that's such a good point. 
Uh, this is one of the things that our founding fathers had to deal with. And you notice here that Nehemiah was not engaging in any offensive action against any opposition. It was only defensive. And one of the things that we know, even from back to the Battle of Lexington, the first battle for the American War for Independence, was Pastor Jonas Clark had taught his people. He said, you cannot start anything. Now, if you get attacked, you have a right of self-defense, but you can't start anything. And, and this is such a good attitude and a good thing to know is even though you have a trowel in your hand or you have a weapon or whatever it is, and we're not... We're still talking figurative here, not literal. But even if we were talking literal, you don't have the right to go on the offense. You have the right to defend yourself when attacked. And that's what Nehemiah said. Hey, if we get attacked, let's rally there and defend. But you don't have the right to start something. And, and that's a big biblical teaching that really needs to be highlighted today, not only in a literal level, but a figurative level as well. We read that Nehemiah was beset by specific individuals who antagonized him at every turn. They, they tried to undermine his work and induce him to sin. How did Nehemiah respond? That's right. Yeah, and it is amazing to me how he stayed focused on the work and did not get distracted. And I think that's one of the opposition's tactics many times is to, is to get us distracted. As, as you look at all the things that came at Nehemiah over that period of time, he just kept coming back to the work. Here, here's what I've got to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to get distracted with your open letters. I'm not going to distracted with your threats of attack. I'm not going to get distracted with the fact that you wrote the king. And there's just, there's a lot of good stuff there on focus that I think would be helpful for all of us. David, the title of the series is Jesus in the Old Testament. Where do you see the Messiah in Nehemiah, whether a pre-incarnate Christophany or a type or maybe a foreshadowed? You know, it's very interesting that Nehemiah, we often look at Nehemiah and we look at the book and it's called Nehemiah. And we think of Nehemiah, and yet out of the 13 chapters, six of them deal with the priest and not with Nehemiah, who's the, the political leader. Uh, it, it's interesting, you have first Zerubbabel, and then you have Ezra. And so the rebuilding of the temple, the restoration of the spiritual stuff was key to that. And it's interesting to me that even at the end, you have Nehemiah and Ezra walking around the walls together, the rebuilt walls, rededicating them to God. And so with all of the work that Nehemiah was doing, the spiritual component, the spiritual, the spiritual basis is what's key. And by the way, I, I'll tell you quite literally, uh, we, we work with hundreds and hundreds of, of legislators, congressmen, et cetera. Uh, we have a legislative network, about a thousand legislators actively doing, we, we monitored 159,000 pieces of legislation this year, state level, everything you can think of. And we always tell these guys, look, you got an office, you need an intercessor with you. you. You need an Ezra. You need a Zerubbabel. You need a priest. You're the Nehemiah guy. You're the one who wants to go out and, and, and take on the culture and rebuild the stuff and get, that's great. But you need that guy that nobody ever pays attention to who is the, in the temple and he's praying and he's fasting. And he's doing all the stuff. And you got to get intercessors and activists connected. And so one way that I see Jesus in this is the spiritual foundation that has to be part of any activist. And we've got a lot of activists and a lot of people called to do things, whether it's life or marriage or, or choice or whatever it is, you got to keep, you got to keep that spiritual part centered. So I, I think there's that, but I also think you can look at Nehemiah and say, Hey, this is a figure of Christ, the rebuilding, the restoration, the, the bringing the culture back. And he kept pointing people to God. So I, I see a, a lot of both figurative and, and maybe more symbolic aspects of Christ in, because you do see Christ in every aspect of every book of the Bible. And he is the great rebuilder of that, which has been torn down in our lives individually and in our culture as well. Uh, but I also think there's the, the aspect that, hey, as individuals, whatever we are, whatever we're called to do, don't forget the spiritual side over here that goes with it. The, the priests, the, the Ezra's and the Zerubbabel's, you've got to have that at the base of what you do. David, you've mentioned one of the other men who was inspired to return to Jerusalem was Zerubbabel, who received a mighty promise from the Lord through the prophet Haggai. What promise does God offer to those who put their trust in Him, follow as He leads, and overcome all the challenges even that we experience? You know, part of the overcoming means you're going to have a lot of battles. You don't overcome, you don't win if you don't fight. And so sometimes I think overcomers People like the concept of overcoming without thinking about what overcomer means. It means you have struggles. You have a lot of tough stuff. You've got a lot of stuff that, that, that is not good. And yet uh, I've, I've learned life lessons over periods of time. And Nehemiah would, would be an example of one of them. But, you know, when, when you look at, I just share life lessons real quick. One of the life lessons, and I think there's four life lessons that, that guide me, but 
One is that nothing catches God by surprise. Uh, we often think that it does, and it may surprise us, and God, not surprised. He knew it was coming long before. And then when something happens, God's more and more, it, it's more important to God how we respond to what happens than whether what happens was right or wrong. Uh, you know, quite frankly, what happened to Job wasn't fair. He did nothing to deserve that, but that wasn't the point. The point one was God said, hey, you watch how Job responds. He's going to do the right thing regardless of what happens to him. What happened to Joseph wasn't fair. What happened to Daniel wasn't fair. It's not about whether it's fair. And so overcoming means you're going to have to face some adversity. It means you're going to have to face some things that aren't fair, things that are going to be easy to get bitter about. But God has so much confidence in you. He's saying to Satan, you watch. He's going to do the right thing. He's going to respond the right way. It's going to be great. And that's part of the overcomer thing is you are going to have things to overcome. And it's not a smooth ride. And you're going to have a lot of stuff that's not fair. And what happened to Nehemiah wasn't fair. He was sent back by the king. So why would they turn on him? Why would they try to attack him? He's, he's commissioned by the king to do this. That's part of life is all the unfair stuff that happens. And so part of being an overcomer is, you're going to have a lot of trash and a lot of garbage to wade through. And you shouldn't look at that and say, woe is me. You should look at that and say, oh boy, another challenge. I get, I get to whip this thing. And I think that's the confidence God has. And it's like, like with Job and Satan, he says, watch Satan, Job's going to do the right thing. You, you just watch, he will. And that's part of the overcomer aspect. David, with the inspired leadership of Nehemiah and others, uh, people eventually confess their sins we read and they repented. Look at chapter nine, especially verses 34 through 38. What encouragement does that offer us today? You know, it's, it's interesting because they repented of the sin, not only of their sin, but the sin of their forefathers, because they're not the ones that had that wall torn down. That Most of them were born after that. It's 70 years since the wall's been destroyed. They're not the ones that committed the sin that God said, okay, I'm going to have to spank you as a nation. I'm going to have to tear this down. Uh, so it's interesting that, that they said, you know what? Even the sins of our fathers have an effect on us. And we need to repent of those sins. So being sin conscious, because it would have been very easy for them to be self-righteous and say, we're not the reason this went down. We're not the ones that caused this. It was our fathers who had the idolaters. Our That's not it. You have to identify and say, you know what? We have a sinful nature and we need that nature acknowledged. And by the way, even the generation before us, we have to identify with what they've done and say, you know what? We're even the product of some of what they've done so that the the concept of identifying and acknowledging sin is one of the first things. You can't forsake sin and you can't turn against it if you don't first identify that it exists and it is there. And so even if it's somebody else's sin, like my forefather's sin, like those from 100 years ago, got to acknowledge that sin and say, you know what, but it, I'm not going to let that sin come back into the culture or into me. It's not going to be a part of what I do. And I'm, I'm going to live above that sin level. And so I think it was important that those people who confessed their sin weren't just confessing their own sin. They were confessing the sins of those who had come before, of generations before. And this is part of what we as Americans have to do, too. We've got plenty of good things in our past. We've got plenty of sinful things in our past. And we can't just ride around on the fact that America is a really blessed nation, which it is. We got to look at some other things and say, you know what, sins of our forefathers, but we're going to learn from that. We're going to, as the Bible says, forsake our sin, including those of our forefathers, and we're going to move forward and make this a bright, shining example. Well, David, you are such an inspiration to so many, including me. And so thank you for sitting down with us today via Zoom. And just tell us, how can our viewers connect with the tremendous work you're doing at Wall Builders? Uh, Tim, they can go to wallbuilders.com. And there they will find a plethora of information about America, about rebuilding America, about where we are, opportunities, examples, unknown history, uh, which is part of the, the fun stuff, too, that you find that as Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls, one of the things that said they did was they rebuilt the wall, the, they rebuilt what they called the Hall of the Heroes. They recovered their own history. They went back and said, hey, look at the great heroes we had. Let, let's remember our heroes. And so that's part of what we do at Wall Builders is help recover the Hall of Heroes. And we have some great ones that have gotten away from us that we need to recover. Well, David, may the Lord's blessing be on you and your staff. And in the closing words of Nehemiah, remember David, oh my God, for good. Thank you, brother. I received that. God bless you. Something David said today pricked my own heart. We've long pointed to Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 for its prophetic significance. 
The writer indicates strongly that we will discern the season of the Lord's return because he writes that we should encourage each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. But I think there is a warning inherent in this passage that amounts to a sign being manifested today. Just like Jude's admonition to contend earnestly for the faith and Paul's prophecy of rising heresy and apostasy, the writer of Hebrews indicates that if we allow the confession of our hope to waver, we will be tempted to forsake our own assembling together. We've documented the disastrous and unconstitutional prohibitions against gathering to worship imposed by authoritarian governors over the past two years, but too many Christians are engaged in self-imposed exile from their fellow believers. Complaining of strife within the church or a shifting list of grievances, they are isolating themselves from the body of Christ, something Paul and the other apostles would have found abhorrent. Apply the wisdom of Ecclesiastes 4.12 and stay united with fellow believers. Even if you are strong enough to stand on your own, your presence may be just the encouragement a brother or sister in Christ needs. It's so important to stay connected with other believers, isn't it, Tim? Sure is. I mean, too many Christians have this lone wolf mentality thing that they can go it alone or buying into that false claim that's just me and Jesus. Exactly. You know, our Lord does not give us that option. He said that He would build His church, referred to in the New Testament by the Greek word ekklesia, a called out assembly. We are commanded to become a part of the body of Christ, not drift off as some kind of self-sufficient organism. David Barton also makes the powerful point that every person must do what they can, but that together we can accomplish much. By ourselves, we tend to lose focus and despair, just like Elijah. Nehemiah also demonstrates that God's plan for the Jewish people cannot be thwarted. He preserved and protected them while they were in exile. His Holy Spirit stirred the heart of a pagan king, allowing them to return to Israel to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He provided gifted leaders like Nehemiah, but the Lord gets all the credit for keeping His ancient promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As He still does today. Now, folks, if you want to understand God's timeless plan to bless the Jewish people, you'll want to get a copy of Dr. David Reagan's book, The Jewish People, Rejected or Beloved. For a gift of $20 or more, we'll be glad to send you a copy. One of the themes that runs throughout the Old Testament is God's unchanging promise to bless the Jewish people and to use them as a conduit of blessing to the rest of the world. The greatest manifestation of that blessing is our Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. We trust that you're still following along and reading each book as we come to it and picking out your own key verse or verses. Ours for this week are Nehemiah 6, 15 through 16, 8, 10, and 9, 20. Visit our website to access our key verse commentary to understand the significance of these verses. Well, your reading assignment for next week is the short book of Esther. Look for Jesus in the book and life of Esther. Until then, I'm Nathan Jones. And I'm Tim Moore saying, look up, be watchful for the Lord whose joy is our strength and who helps us accomplish all He calls us to do is drawing near. Tim